Praise the Lord. Why don't we just take a few seconds, turn around to somebody, say hello. I know we all love this part of the service, but just take one moment, say hello. If you don't know the person, introduce yourself, ask them your name, and loosen ourselves up a wee bit in the presence of the Lord. Point of order, point of order. <laughs> Can't get you stopped. Turn with me, please. We're going to be reading from the book of Psalms this morning. Psalm chapter 34. It's a wonderful psalm. I suspect many of you will already know this psalm this morning. A simple theme for you and I this morning, as we live for God in these days, is honoring God uh, with our lives. And that's the theme that the Lord has given to me for us today, that as we live for Jesus, that we remember this that we are called out of sin and out of that sort of lifestyle that we once lived. And God, in his divine mercy and grace, has chosen you and I to bring honor to his name. It's a wonderful privilege, but what a responsibility that we have. And this is just a remembrance this morning to you and I from the word of God that we are called to honor God. Isn't that wonderful that he chose something as the basis, at least myself at least, to, and you to bring honor to his name. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. May God be glorified through your life and through my life, through your ministry and, and through my ministry. May we reach the end of our life and people say about us, what a man, what a woman. Truly they brought honor to the Lord and all they did. Amen, church. So that's our, that's our theme this morning. So Father, we thank you at this moment, God, just for this time. Father, we thank you for answered prayer even over this church. Where Lord, we ask for good problems. And Father, you've been faithful in that. Lord, we, we've seen an increase, Lord, in, in children, Lord, and people. Lord, a desire within the congregation, Lord, to go out through these doors, Father. Great problems, but problems. And Father, we thank you that we are looking at these things and thanking you for them. And Father, we desire, Father, not just to do church, not just to play a game, God, with ourselves and with the world, but Lord, to be the church, to be that church that, Lord, takes people and points them to Jesus, that sees the broken, that sees the downcast, the addict, set free and restored and saved and honoring God with their life. So, Father, we thank you that there's much testimony here this morning of how the Lord Jesus Christ saved, Lord, us and transformed us and is using us to glorify your wonderful name. And, Father, we thank you for that. But, Lord, as we search through the scriptures this morning, may you enlighten our hearts. Father, may we examine ourselves and make sure that, Father, who we are and what we are is honorable unto you, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And amen. Let us read together Psalm 34, starting from verse 3, just four or five verses this morning. Listen to the, the very first word of verse 3. I love it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. That's what the psalmist is speaking to you and I this morning. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Verse 3, and let us exalt his name together. He goes on to say, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. And those who look to him are radiant. And their faces shall never be ashamed. What about that church? No longer in shame as we once were. The Lord promises that all who seek him and live for him, shame shall no longer be their portion. That's the word of God. Listen to this verse 6. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angels of the Lord in camps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because blessed is the man and of course the woman who takes refuge in him. Amen. Oh, magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. What a, what a word, what an instruction, what an invitation that we have been given to us this morning. But in the context, this text is a call to the people to honor God with their life. That's quite simply what it is. It's an invitation to come and to live for God. And this call in David's day would not have been a popular one with everyone, as you might think. But at least it was a call for godliness. It was a call to live right before men uh, and right before God from the head of state. David was the king of Israel. So this is from the top down. Remember that. This is, a, this is a, a declaration over the nation. Let us come and magnify the Lord. 
And this call to honor God from the top of government, make no mistake about it, it would flow down into every area of society. Because that's what godly leadership does. It flows down and it trickles into every area of society. And as a result in this, we see that Israel was blessed during David's reign. There's a lesson in this now. Israel was blessed because of David's desire to honor God. And I want to tell you this morning, if you have a desire to honor God with your life, God will honor you and he will bless you and he'll bless your home. He'll bless your children and your children's children. He'll bless your business. He'll bless all that he has for you. And that's what we see in Scripture. Here we see that David honored God. And what we see is that God expanded Israel's territory under David's reign. They took over many towns and cities. They also held, took hold of Jerusalem, which later would become the capital of Israel. David made, made God the God of the nation. And what we see quite clearly is that the nation was blessed and flourished. In Psalm 33, David writes, writes this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. See, David knew what he was talking about. He had tried and tested this theory. He chose to put God first. Out of all the other idols, of all the gods that he could have chose, he chose the one true God of Israel. And, and that God showed up and blessed not only David, but the whole nation was blessed through the faithfulness of making God, honoring God with them. Now listen, you and I, we're not in a, in a position of influence like David was. But rest assured that how you and I live our life will influence many, many people. We need to remember that. How, how we live our life, who we really are outside of church contact will influence many, many people. Today, the call to honor God is, well, to say a scoff that would be probably too late a term. Nobody takes it seriously anymore. It's ignored both by individuals and by nations alike. What I seem to see taking place is that God has been pushed out of nearly every area of society. Again, it's only what I can see. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Secularism seems to be the new religion. We don't need God anymore. We don't want God anymore. We can do better on our own. That's what secularism is. It's just take all religion out of it. We can do this by ourselves. We're doing a great job, I suppose. There seems to be a new age, a new generation, a cell phone generation rising up that don't believe in God. That's why we have such an important role to play here with our kids' ministry. Please excuse me if I say this, but it's very difficult to change the mind of an adult. It's very different to influence a church in the things of God. But to influence a child, we have got a very we've got minds that are open and hearts that are receptive and they will listen to every word that you tell them likewise what we're seeing happening to our younger generation across our world they've been they're listening to every lie they've been told church and it's not wrong to challenge stuff in, in this life it's not wrong to say listen that's not right what you're being taught we, we the free speech is, is free speech we, we're allowed to speak against that which we think is utter nonsense especially when there's absolutely no scientific fact to back up what's being taught in curriculums. So please educate yourself and take a stand. Don't be afraid to say and to challenge. But we're living in a generation, as I call them, a cell phone generation that don't believe in God. Today we have a generation who don't desire to honor their parents, let alone honor God. That's what we're dealing with, church. And that's why the church needs to be reminded of our responsibility, that regardless of what everybody else is doing, perhaps even in this room, regardless of what people's doing, that you and I have made a decision that we are going to honor God. Because that's what we desire to do. And that's what's right. A man by the name of Gabe Bullard, he wrote an article. I often like reading articles. That it just gives you a wee, in, wee insight of what's going on, at least in part throughout the world. His, his article is entitled, The World's Newest Major Religion, and then in brackets, No Religion. And he writes this, There have long been predictions that religion would fade away from being relevant as the world modernizes. Cell phone generation. He goes on to say that France will have a majority secular population very soon. So too will the Netherlands and New Zealand. The United Kingdom and Australia will soon lose their Christian majorities. Religion is rap rapidly becoming less important than it has ever been. Now that's a depressing article in part. But as I read on through it, 
in this article, I, I realized something else that Bullard said. He recognized this. He recognizes that Christianity appears to be in decline in the West. But in many other parts of the world, it's rapidly growing. He mentions, for instance, Africa, China, and many Asian countries, all coming to faith in large numbers daily. He speaks this, and it's an interesting quote. He says, the sectorizing West and the rapidly growing rest. Rest. Tongue twister that. Do you see that? The sectorizing West, but the rapidly growing rest of the world. This shows the cancer of sectorism that we are part of. That sectorism has just got in to such a level that people are just falling away. But in other parts of the world, where there's perhaps not so much wealth around to come to the Lord in their droves. And can I say this to you, because I had to say this to myself, don't allow media, media or surveys to discourage you in your faith. You need to be careful too of deception. Because what is very clear is God is still working very much in our land. Never ever believe the lie that God's not working in your life, in your family, in your land. The spirit of Antichrist tells people that faith is dead. That, that no longer are people interested in, in God or believe in God or, or creationism or, or pro-life or any of these other things that are scoffed at today. And, and be careful of this because it will come into your heart. It will be placed before you that, that, that religion's dead, that this thing is only for, for the few now. We've got on to better things. I want to show you this spirit at work in the, New, in the Old Testament. You don't need to turn. Just, just listen and with me and, and I'll bring you through it. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, we read about that ungodly king, King Ahab, and his 450 false prophets who stood in Mount Carmel. You know the story. These prophets of Baal, whose God was powerless to help them, but yet still worshipped. We read about how Elijah, after a whole episode, called upon the Lord, his own Lord, the one true God, who then consumed the sacrifice that the prophet of, or the God of Baal could not do. And this displayed the glory and the power and the reality of God, a God who's in control, even when there's vast atheism in the land. And Elijah took, Elijah took the 450 prophets, false prophets, and he killed, he killed them in the Chrisron Valley. And that's the, that's the danger of sin. We need to kill it in our life. We can't, we can't give it room. We can't give it territory. We need to just purge it completely out of our lives. And Elijah seen God move. I want you to see this. He's seen what God move in a nation that had completely turned her back on God. That means God still works in places we think he's forsaken like the West. Elijah seen God move in a nation where, that had turned her back on God. But what I want to say is this, because it's a reality. The weight of being surrounded by so much ungodliness can weaken even the strongest man or woman of faith. When we are just surrounded by so much apathy, so much apostasy, so much things that look good but really aren't good when you look deep enough, it's really difficult at times not to become influenced by these things. It can be weighty. And in chapter 19, which is a chapter after this great work of God, we read about Ahab again. And he goes and he speaks to his good old wife, that, that lovely woman called Jezebel, that ungodly woman. And if you ever bring a woman home to your granny called Jezebel, be prepared for her to be chased out the door. You do not bring Jezebel home to granny. What Elijah had done, he, or Ahab told his wife what Elijah had done to these prophets. And Jezebel sent word. Now, notice it was words. It was words. Be careful of words. Be careful who speaks into your life. She sent word to Elijah, telling this mighty man of God that this time tomorrow he would be dead. One would think Elijah wouldn't be moved by it. And as we know, we read that Elijah was very afraid. And in fact, he left his post and he ran for his life. And as I look through the text, what I noticed is this. I just give you the, the bullet points to save your energy, to keep you awake. Elijah found, Elijah found himself in the wilderness very quickly. Because that's what listening to the wrong people will do. It'll send you straight into the wilderness, into a place of brokenness, a place of isolation, a place, a place where you will not understand how you even got here. Be careful who you allow to speak into your life. So we found he was in the wilderness. Then I realized that his prayers went from 
faith-filled prayers on Mount Carmel, the prayers requesting that God would take his life. He wanted to die. That's what can happen very quickly in the hearts of the people of God when wickedness is around us. And at times, church, the wickedness that is around us can weaken us. The spirit of oppression at times can cause us to desire to be gone from this world as we see with Elijah. But God, the, the one whom we exalt and honor and magnify, right through Scripture promises that he helps his people in such times as these. And as Elijah lay there, he was troubled in spirit. He was troubled in mind. I want you to see this now because it will help some of you today who's struggling in your mind, who's struggling in spirit, and you think you're not, a, you're not walking with God. This was a mighty man of God, troubled, greatly troubled in spirit and mind. And we told, we're told that the Lord ministered to him. And that's what the Lord does. In his own way, he ministers to his people, to you and I individually. He knows the struggles. He knows our, our, our fears, our concerns, and he constantly is ministering to his people. And what we see is that as Elijah struggled over 40 days that the Lord provided for him food and water and ministers. He sent the angels to him. And it's a wonderful picture of how, listen, if you wonder how you made it this far, because God has been faithful in ministering to your life this far. As simple as that. He's been good to you. And he will continue to be good to you. But listen, after 40 days, here's where this man of God found himself. He was in a cave sleeping. In a cave. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there this morning. And all who belong to the Lord Jesus in these days will sometimes just find it easier to live in a cave than to be out in this world. Isn't that it? Sometimes it's just easier to lock the door, bolt the hatches, turn off the phone, and lock ourselves away. But listen, listen as Elijah lay there in the cave, isolated from the world and in a place of depression, the Lord of the word of the Lord now, the word of the Lord come to him. That's important. You remember, it's the word that, that brings us on and sets us free. And the Lord says this to him, what are you doing, Elijah? It's not anything profound. It's not a parable. It's, Elijah, what are you doing? And maybe that's for somebody here this morning. And the voice of the Lord's asked you, look, what are you doing? Why are you allowing this to affect you in such a way? Why are you running from this weak woman who is nothing but cunning and deceitful in nature? In other words, this is what God is saying, Elijah, why have you been hiding away from this world that I've sent you into? Why are you running from this Jezebel? Why have you allowed a spirit of fear to consume you and imprison you and leave you in a cave? Have you forgotten who you are, Elijah? I suspect is one of the thoughts. Because you're a prophet. You're a man of God. Not just any God, but the one true God of Israel. The God that destroyed the sacrifice just 40 days ago when them 450 false prophets could do absolutely nothing. Did I not show you that even in a land that's barren, I'm with you? It's time to get up, Elijah. And it's time to get out of the cave. And many of God's people have forgotten who they are in Christ. You remember the fall in Genesis where everything became corrupt, creation was destroyed, sin entered the world. And God promises that in the end he's going to make a new heaven, a new earth. But in between times he promises that all who come to faith he's going to make into a new creation straight away. Have we forgotten who we are in Christ? We are a new creation today. Oh, yes, there's fears, there's uncertainties, there's doubts, there's questions. There's all these things and there's wickedness all around us, even in us at times. But how have we forgotten who we are as a new creation, the new man, the new woman of God? Wonderful testimony. Where we once lay and now where we stand, we don't lie in the gutter ashamed anymore, but he's removed that from us and he's rebuilding our lives and here's what Elijah responds to God when he's lying in his wee cave hiding feeling sorry for himself he says this but God I've got great seal for you we can have great seal for God but yet hide in a cave 
It could be displayed in worship, perhaps, but when it comes to honoring God with the important things, we, we fall away. And, and Elijah, in one sense, he's trying to set himself up to be, as a good defense, say, I've got great seal for you, God. And then listen to what he says. He blames other people, because I love doing that too, because it takes the pressure away from me, and you do as well. We blame other people for what's going on in our hearts. And he says this to God. He says, the Israelites have rejected your covenant. So that's why I'm hiding in the cave. They have torn down your altars. They put your prophets to death with a sword. And listen, I'm the only one left, God. And they're trying to kill me too. What a poor picture of a man who's lost his way. And this same lie has been spread that faith is gone, religious is, religion is dead, as we've read today from our article. The same lie in Elijah's heart. Religion's dead. Do you see it? It's a lie. It's an antichrist spurred at work. And listen, Elijah had taken his eyes off God. He'd, he'd looked onto that Jezebel. And all this evil around him began to affect him. And at this moment in Elijah's life, you know, all that he could see was, was brokenness. He could see broken walls but once housed godliness. And there's nothing, there's nothing that's worse, as bad for a believer. To look around and see those who once praised God, once walked with God, now living in the world. It's, it's daunting. It's daunting, I, I think. When I first came to faith within two years, there was at least 25 men from my, 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 my area, what we, we run about in my circles. And I'd say two-thirds of them have went back into the world. And it's done. And there's times I ask myself, have I, got, have I missed something? Have I been deceived? You see, we need to be careful of these spirits that would seek to, 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 to tell us that religion's dead. And what Elijah seen was broken walls. Righteousness had fallen in the streets. The once godly had become ungodly. The same people, the religious systems, had pulled down the altars of true worship. And they'd built altars of false worship onto Baal. And we need to be careful of that as well. And they rejected truth because they killed the prophets. They didn't want the word preached anymore. And you know, as I considered this in, in, in the backlog of how we honor God and the difficulties that we will face, I realized that Elijah's day is not unlike our own. The godly appear to be getting harder to find. Carnal worship seems to be replacing that which once was true, spirit-filled worship. God just comes and inhabits the praises of his people, even if the singing's rough. <laughs> yeah, isn't that right? Even if the singing's rough. Last week, you noticed I tried to start a song off here and, and you guys sang and the presence of God was here. I said, I don't care if it's rough, as long as it's true. I love it to be great. And it's still true. But let's make sure we're not, we're not making carnal worship look good. The carnal worship was replaced. And what I say is, and please, again, this is my view, this part. But weigh it up. I, I seem to see that millions of people love to sing about living for Jesus. But very few desire to die to this world like Jesus did. And that can be daunting. And that can be a picture of what's really true worship. Can't it? Because we, we can play it or we can call it out. To follow Jesus, I find it very difficult. Because I, there's certain things I have to abstain from. We don't like to say no to ourselves. And, and what we see is in, in society that very few desire to live like Jesus lived. So what we see is a bundle of people who are praising God. And they've got it into their mind that there's no longer a need for sacrifice anymore. So... They just do what they want because God understands, I think. And so what happens is that these people pull down the altars of sacrifice in their life. <laughs> There's no more any sacrifice. It's easy. Just live for Jesus. Do you know what? I'm blood bought, I'm blood covered. It doesn't matter what I do because my, what are my actions and who I am will not influence anybody else. And God understands. It's a lie, by the way. I want to show you that tonight. So they pull down the altars of sacrifice in their life. Let us not pull down the altars. Let us not live legalistic either, though. We're walking in grace. We're living in grace. We are sinners saved by grace. We will make mistakes. There'll be things enter this mind that you will never share with people. But we are blood-bought, and we need to build altars of sacrifice. There is sacrifice in the Christian life. So they pull down the altars. And then, thankfully today, there's not many preachers are killed in the West. But because no one listens anymore, 
many pulpits have become vacant and God no longer sends his man. That's happening, church. Nobody wants to listen anymore. Look at our nations. They don't want it. And I want you to notice Elijah's thinking at this point because this is the, this is the, the spirit of Antichrist at work because Elijah seemed to declare that, Lord, I am the only one left here. Church, it's easy for us to think that we're the only church here in the country that's gone on for Jesus. I don't know how well-traveled you are. I'm fairly well-traveled. I get about. I've been right to the other end of the world. In every nation I've been, i found believers worshiping Jesus. Every nation. Every nation. So let us not believe this lie that we're lost, dying, stunned, like the Jews in Masada. We are not the Jews in Masada. We are a people that is a global church and God is at work in the land and we need to remind ourselves of this but Elijah believed this and many of God's people to believe this too and it's a lie but God speaks to Elijah in verse 18 into his troubled spirit he says listen Elijah you need to know something in this wee land of godlessness ungodliness I have reserved 7,000 men in Israel yes those whose knees have never bowed down to Baal and whose mouth has never kissed him you're not alone, Elijah. Now wise up and get up out of that cave and start honoring me and walking in the calling that I've called you to be. Amen, church. We're not alone. We're not alone. Church, don't be fooled or disheartened. God's people are everywhere. And you and I are not all that's left. And thank God we're not or the world will be in great trouble. If we're all that's left in this land to reach the people, we're in great trouble. But don't get caught up in what Bullard says in his in his article, The Secularizing West and the Rapidly Growing West. But let all the people of God in Ireland magnify the Lord and exalt his name. Now, a closing few points. How do we exalt God as believers? If you're taking notes. Well, the first thing we do to honor God is to get out of the cave and rid ourselves of this spirit of fear and this Jezebel spirit that's about now, the Jezebel spirit can be defined in many ways, but quite simply put, it's a cunning spirit. It's a deceptive spirit that will tell you that you're the only one left. Or it's the one that tells you that you're going to die, go and hide in the cave. It's the one that tells you you're not worth anything. You know that spirit? Have you experienced that? that you, what have you to offer? You have nothing to offer. That's the spirit of Jezebel. Rebuke it. Send it back to Ahab where it belongs. There's no place in the life of the believer. To magnify God, there's action required. There's sacrifice needed. Altars need to be built. And here's the part. I want you to notice the invitation of the action. Because the psalmist writes, magnify the Lord, you his people, and, and exalt his name. So there's action here. So what action is required? Well, here's your first point. Honor God in all you do. That's your first point. And if you do that, you'll do well. The Bible tells us that we are to honor God in everything we do, 1 Corinthians 10. One commentator puts it this way, our manner, now listen to this, it's the wee thing, it's not just the big thing. Our manners as well as our mouth encourage or discourage the honor of God. Do you get that? Our manner, our attitude, our words, how we treat people, how we speak to one another, about one another, will bring either honor or dishonor. So what I say to you, I say to myself, Neil, mind what you say, and especially about those who are God's servants. Be careful. Our actions carry influence. Here's why I want to prove this to you. When David committed his two sins of adultery and murder, he was told by the prophet Nathan, by this deed, David, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You see, David pulled the altars down. He, he didn't say no anymore. And what happened was the enemy got opportunity to boast and mock and blaspheme God. Let us make sure we give no occasion to the wicked to mock God in our life. So first point, we honor God in our conversation. We honor God. We honor God in our conversation. We honor God in our workplace. We honor God in our actions. And we honor God in our home. Now listen. I've had to learn this the hard road. I'm, I'm not going to be shy about it. Many people get this wrong. A lot of people I've met on the streets get this wrong. Standing in the streets, preaching through microphones and getting this very wrong. They 
they honor God in the streets, but they don't honor God in their homes. And they're like a clanging cymbal to their family. Ministry overflows from our homes. Not from here, not from there, from our homes. And that's where you're going to find the challenge. All he wants to serve Jesus, you're going to find your home being attacked. And that's where you have to find the challenge. You have to overcome in the home and you'll find the ministry right by will flow for you. Psalm, David writes this in Psalm 101, it's a psalm on holiness. And he says this, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Here's a king who understands the importance of ministry that flows from the home. He's on to say this, my eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, why? That they may dwell with me. That tells me that we also honor God by the company we keep. If we run about with the unrighteous, don't be, don't be surprised if you become unrighteous. So we honor God in all we do. The second one, short points these are, we invite the unsaved to come to God and be saved. The psalmist writes, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. What an invitation to each person. He, he, he wants others to come and to honor and exalt God with him. Now listen, this is not a call to believers only. This is a call to all who are not yet saved to come and to honor God and to be saved. And can I ask each of you today, Ask yourself, are you saved? Have you a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Because this is important. And if not, why not? What's holding you back? Let him in and let him save you. David writes this in verse 4. He says, I sought the Lord. That's the way to salvation. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. See, only the Lord can relieve us from our troubled soul. And that's what the scriptures teach. And David says, I sought the Lord and he delivered me. Not only did he receive deliverance, church, he received a new song. I want you to see this. He received a new countenance. He received a heavenly joy. In verse 5, he goes, those who look to him are radiant. They're different. You ever notice that Christians are different? Most Christians are different. They've got a joy about them. Even when there's a grumpy face on, there's a joy in their lives. There's I have a grumpy face most times. My wedding photograph, you'd think I was hit with a stick. But I was joyous. It doesn't all come outwards, but inwards there's a joy. There's a peace that comes to the people of God. Those who look to the Lord, David says, are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. What duckle did you lie in before you come to faith? What saints or drink-stained clothes did you wear? What actions did you get up to before the Lord Jesus Christ saved you? And he's taken away all that shame. Glory to God. And for many of us, we're still on a journey. Of course we are, but we're no longer in shame. Because those who look to the Lord are different. They're radiant. And what a promise. Oh, come, he says, and magnify the Lord with me. And this is a gospel call to each person today. So we honor him in turning to him. In, uh, or we honor him in all we do. We honor him by inviting the unsaved. And we honor him by turning to him in prayer for help. Now listen. This is important too. As I've seen this in this psalm. How easy is it for us when things go wrong to turn to everything else but help? Do you ever do that? You ring everybody's auntie's uncle's sister to get help. But the one thing that we really struggle to do is to drop down and seek the Lord. Has anybody experienced that? Anybody? Come on, there has to be one. I've never, I've never experienced that personally, by the way, but we all have experienced that. And I know you're being honest and these people are just shy. But how easy is it, is it for us to turn to everybody else? And David writes this about himself. And this takes humility. This takes humility. This poor man cried out. He didn't say this, this great mighty man who slain bears and tigers, lions. This poor man. Because that's what we are without Christ, church. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. And here's where David was. He was in a bad place. Saul, King Saul, had become bitter against him. He tried to kill him. He was on the run. And as he fled from Saul, he fell into the hands of Abimelech. Abimelech is another name for a Philistine king. It's like Pharaoh, another name for the Egyptian king. And he fell into the hands of Abimelech. And, and we're told that David prayed. It's interesting. As, as he stood there before Abimelech, he, he actually prayed into himself and asked the Lord for help. And the Lord put it on his spur to act as if he was insane before Abimelech. And so he did. He acted like he was not wise before the Philistine king, and the king sent him on his way. And it's safe to say today that many believers today are also 
a wee bit insane not wise but thankfully there's none in this church these are all steady level-headed people praise the lord but the lord heard him he tells us and saved them out of all his troubles now here's the thing the the the, the hebrew word troubles means this when you look into the root of it to be restricted to be tied up to be limited i wonder is that you this morning is there a restriction in your life is there something some situation you've got into and you're a wee bit tied up or you're limited in what you can do to help yourself and that's what life can bring our way we can find ourselves in a place we can do absolutely nothing to help ourselves it's as if we're just tied up and powerless and david found himself in such a place and church take take comfort in that 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 this is this is normal for mighty men like david and everyday people like you and i david found himself in a position where he was facing death and we've all gonna face that position by the way at some point he found himself facing death he was exiled from his friends and his family he was in a foreign land and he was tired and he was hungry no better time to attack a man when he's tired and hungry i want you to notice david's choice of words here he says this poor man cried now let me just make it very clear what david wasn't david was soon to be the next king of of israel david wasn't poor in the things of god he was poor in material things at this point. And like all believers, there is a promise of a better future in Christ. And at this point in David's life as a future king, he had nothing. He was hungry. And we're told that he went to the priests and he got some showbread to eat, which was forbidden. It was only for the priests to eat, the high priests to eat. And listen, when Saul heard that the priests had helped him, in his anger, he killed all of them, bar one. And what I want to say this to you, church, is when you seek to honor God and live for God like David, you're going to feel the gates of hell surround you. Because that's what the scriptures teach. Because it's easy to pull down the altars and live like a dog. But when you build the altars and live for God, you will find that things will come against you. You will find the Jezebel spirit come knock on your door. You will find people will speak things into your life that will seek to discredit you who you are. They'll try to throw your past up to try and stop you from having your future in Christ. And we have to be strong and, and, and build strong altars and say, you live like you, li you want to live, but I'm going to trust God. And David, he felt the gates of hell surround him. And you know what he, do? he did? He didn't ring his aunt, his uncle's cousin. He sought the Lord, the scripture tells us. In humility, David turned towards God, one of the hardest things to do in the day of trouble. And what I see with this man is that in all that he was and who he was, there was no pride at this point found in his heart. Humility, which was last week's topic, is the way of the godly. And in humility, David turned towards God and he cried out, this poor man. And you can have much today, church, in the way of wealth. You can have lots and lots of things. But if you haven't a real living cultivated relationship with the lord jesus christ and you're not saved you're, you're you're poor really i don't know about you but i've had to make a will recently it kills me to do it by the way all that hard work just to give it to your man there and your woman she's looking at me but do you know if, if 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 this wealth that we chase after and look at i love building barns like the next but if it really really was ours I wouldn't be leaving no will for it. Would, would I? I'd be bringing it with me. Sorry, you can, I'll give you a bit, but I'm taking it. You see, all we really have or don't have in this life is Christ. We either have it or we don't. We either have hope in Christ or we don't. Yes, we wee bit of money is nice. Thank God for it. It's handy when you have to pay a bill, but it's not who we are. And what we learn with David is that poverty is not a hindrance to praying, church. In fact, I would go a bit further and say that pro prosperity is probably a bigger hindrance in praying than, prosperity, or than poverty. Consider the Laodicea in church. They become so established, so great, so financially well off. And they say this about themselves, sure, look, I'm rich and I've increased with goods, I've need of nothing. Paul says you're poor, you're wretched, you're naked. Honor God, church. 
put him first. And he will not only fill the barns, he'll even build them for you. But don't honor the money or the wealth, the God of this world. Honor him and he'll add these other things. Now, pride keeps men down. Humility lifts men up out of the pit of despair. And I want to encourage you, if you're in that place, go home, get into your closet place. You know that place I talked about one time when I had to brush out? That's where it happens. That's where hearts are changed. That's where vision's given. That's where mountains are pulled down. Now we're nearly finished. Jesus says, Jesus' brother James, his half-brother James says this, the effectual, the factual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. And if you break that word down, basically what it's saying that is if, 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 if our prayers are not earnest, that if we don't really expect God to, to really move, the chances are he'll not. And I feel at times that, that prayers, even in my own life, are often done in a somewhat casual way. Prayers from the head. You know them prayers? But not from the heart. And our prayers are to be fervent. Prayers come from a burning heart and an eagerness for God to move. And I thank God for what took place here on Wednesday night. If you're here, you'll agree. God moved. And there was a mighty, mighty flow of prayer. And, and oh, it was just nice. And I'm praying for more of that. And get away from the quietness and the, the awkwardness and just get into that place where one after another the, the God was moving. It was, a, it was a wonderful night. And, and David says this, The Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And there is the encouragement, church, to pray. Believe in your heart that God hears you. You have no problem praying. Believe in your heart, really believe in your heart that God not only hears, but he helps and that he saves and you have no problem praying. So listen, we honor God and turn to him in prayer. And then a wee snippet, just in a, to, to cap it all off, the fourth thing, God honors those who honor him. And I thought it was just a nice way to finish it. There's about four lines left, so persist. I'm nearly there. Just listen to this last wee bit. If we are faithful to God, if we honor God with our lives, he'll honor him, your, you with his life. And David says this, that verse 7, the angels of the Lord are camps around those who fear him and deliver him. Wonderful truth of scripture. And what I see quite simply here, without getting into it in too much depth, is in the round each child of God is stood an angel of the Lord. Think of that. Now, this is not some wee, nice wee story we just tell kids. The Bible teaches that all who fear the Lord, there's an angel stood by them. And this tells me that it's going to be only in eternity that we're going to know what God has protected us from. We're not going to know how many times the enemy was that close to breaking us, destroying us, harming us, and only that angel of the Lord stuck the sword. You see, we're not going to know until eternity, what we've been protected from, but we will know. So listen, church, God honors his people. Those who honor him and he protects them from the hand of the enemy. So let each of us here today make the Lord their God and be saved. Make sure that's right. Then taste and see, David says, that the Lord is good. For blessed is the man who takes refuge in God. Let every man, every woman of God magnify and exalt the Lord by honoring him with their life. We honor him in all we do. We honor him in reaching the unsaved. We honor him in turning to him in prayer for help. We honor the Lord and he in return will honor us. Amen. 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 Team, I'll ask the team to come.